Discovery Church, can I say, um, just personally here, happy Mother's Day. Help me welcome our moms to the house today. Come on. Happy, we love you, mamas. I'm so glad you decided to join us and worship with us this, this Sunday. And um, my, I, I love my wife. My wife is so easy. She's easy, mama. She says, uh, you know, every, every year, what do you, what do you want? What do you, what, what can, how can we make this day special? By the way, Husbands, um, if, you're, if your wife ever says, I don't need anything, she's lying, okay? Don't believe her. Don't believe her. I mean, I'm telling you, I learned the hard way, okay? Just, just I promise you, do not believe her. Just do it. But, but Veronica, she says, she says, you know, she's so awesome. I, I'll take a, some pizza, a cake, and a movie. I'm like, baby, I love you. You're, I love you. You're, I just, that's awesome. So anyway, I don't know what you're doing with your mamas, but I hope you guys are going to make your day special. Welcome, you guys. We're in part four of this six-week installment of the book of Galatians. We're digging into this entire book. It's really a letter. I mean, we call them books, but they're letters. The, the Bible calls them epistles. They're letters written from this one here, written from the apostle Paul to this Galatian churches. And Galatia was modern day Turkey. It was a region of churches that Paul actually planted. And that's what it means to be an apostle. Just a fancy word. He planted churches. He was a church planter. That's how he evangelized. That's how he, he shared the gospel and was and was sharing the gospel with others, which, by the way, that's, that's what we do here at Discovery. That's our method of evangelism is through church planting. That's how we reach the lost here at Discovery. From the very beginning, we say we were going to be a church planting church. So we have three campuses and three more um, on the horizon. Um, you'll hear more about that as times get closer and closer. But um, Paul here, what his model was, he would go to a region and he would preach and the gospel and raise up leaders, and he would just go and do it again in another area. So in this instance, he's writing a letter back to this church because they kind of got off track just a little bit, which, which like a lot of us new Christians, we tend to get, or not new, just all of us, let's be honest, okay, every single one of us can from time to time just get off track. We can just, we can just lose our way a little bit or lose our focus just a little bit, and we need to be readjusted. And so here Paul is writing a letter back just to readjust some things, to correct some things, because what happened was after Paul left them, some Judaizers came into their region and into their churches, and a Judaizer is just, what that means is just Jewish Christians. So they were, they were new believers themselves. Everyone's a new believer at this time. This, this, this gospel's new. So, so they believed in Jesus. They were followers of Jesus, but they also obeyed. This is what it means to be a Judaizer. They obeyed the Old Testament. They still followed the rules of the Old Testament, and they believed in Jesus. So when they come to this Gentile region that does not know the Old Testament, but just has Jesus, that just has grace, that just has freedom, um, they come in and they go, well, that's great you got Jesus. It's great Paul teach Jesus, but you guys, there's so much you're, you're, you're not doing right. And you need, there's a whole bunch of rules that you're not following. There's this old Old Testament thing. And so, and, and so the Galatian church, they just kind of followed suit and just, just started doing things that, that, you know, they, they, that Paul didn't teach them to do. They just started obeying some rules, some Old Testament things. And Paul is kind of fired up here and he writes this letter. So in week number one, which was chapter one, Paul, Paul talks about the two different gospels and that there are two main brands of Christianity that when you know them, when you know what they look like, when you know their characteristics, you can kind of stay in the free, the, the free relationship with Christ instead of this dead religion. That was week one. And week number two, we talked about the secret to not being someone who kind of swings from having this, you know, saved by grace, joy in my relationship with Christ, free in my relationship with Christ to this dead religion where I have to. And it's like, it's, how, what's the secret? We talked about that in week number two, the secret of being someone who's kind of walks in, in that freedom and then last week we talked about chapter 3 where Paul um, takes a whole chapter and he just re-explains grace, the gospel of grace, that it's this free gift of God that fuels the whole process of our, of our walk with Christ. And, and you need to understand grace. You have to, you ha it's so, so important for you to understand grace. So if you missed any of these messages to catch you up where we're at today, we're in chapter 4, I'd encourage you to go watch them online and, and, and it'll land you where we're at today. So today we're going to be talking about this very very important, cool, you know, topic that I believe it, it, um, it, it literally holds all the six messages, all the six chapters of Galatians. This topic holds all of them together. Like it literally is, is a foundation for every other topic. And that is this idea of sonship, that we are sons 
and daughters of God. That you're in this relationship with God. And when you leave that part out, when you leave this relationship part out, this sonship part, nothing else works. The grace doesn't work. It doesn't. The freedom doesn't work. That joy, it doesn't work unless you, you have this, the, the sonship, the, the relationship, uh, when, if, unless you have it right. God never intended to be your religion. He always intended to have a relationship with you. Can I get a better amen? Come on. God never intended to, be in, to, be, to have you accept a religion. He wanted to be in relationship with you. So let me define these terms the sons or sonship with you. Because ladies, please don't get offended at that, ladies. It's just, it really means sonship, really, it means sons and daughters. It means just this adoption. I'm going to read it to you in Galatians 3, 26 to prove it to you, ladies, okay? It says, you are all sons, okay? You're, you're like all of you. You're all sons. And so if that bothers you, ladies, us guys have to live with being the bride of Christ, okay? So that's a trade. It's just a trade-off, Okay? You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, not males. It literally, it literally is this idea of sons of the Spirit, that we are sons. There's, the, there's a Spirit, and so it's, 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 it's one of those mysteries of faith that when that Spirit of sonship gets inside of you, it changes you. It, it, change, it changes it, your life. So let's go to chapter 4. Are you ready for chapter 4 of Galatians, guys? Yeah. Amen? All right, Galatians chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, and he needed to experience all this stuff, born under the law. He, he needed to experience all of life, everything that you would experience, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption. And that's that miraculous thing. Something miraculous would happen, happen there. Adoption to sonship. Now watch this. Because you are his sons... God sent the spirit of his son. I want to time out that right there and just make sure you grab hold of that truth, to grab hold of that thought right there. So there is a spirit of his son that can live inside of you. Okay, this isn't just a belief. This isn't just an idea. This isn't just a perspective. I want you to have that, oh, you're a child of God. No, no, no. There, there is a literal literal son a spirit of the son of god that desires to live inside of you and create change inside of you this is this is something literal that god wants to give you the spirit of his son to live inside of you in our hearts he says and i'm praying that for every single one of you that you would experience this adoption this miracle and i'm telling you if you do it it will it'll change everything if it doesn't if it hasn't happened already my prayer is that it would happen it happened today, you guys. This, it's the Spirit who calls out. So notice the Spirit calls out, Abba, Father. So you're not even addressing God on religious terms anymore. You're addressing God relationally. Now, this may not be a big idea for some of you guys because you've grown up in church maybe, or maybe it's, it, you, uh, you already have the idea of we're children of God or we're in the family of God. So you have this concept Already you understand the concept, but this was a completely foreign idea and concept to the new church, to these Galatian believers and to these Judaizers. This was because God was, God was distant. God was in heaven. God is huge. God is big. God will zap you like a lightning bolt. You better not touch that ark because God will drop you dead. He was that kind of God. He was, there's this concept of God, up, I believe, to this point. I believe that some of those ideas, are, they still carry over into our Christianity today. That we have this wrong view of God. So he's saying, look, this is different. Now, now through, this, through, this, through the spirit of his son, I can cry out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave. I love that song. You're no longer a slave. He contrasts the, sla the slave versus the son. But you're God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir, which I'm going to explain in just a minute. So I want to help you understand the difference, because chances are there are some of us in here today that could be operating out of the wrong kind of relationship. We're operating out of a, a slave mentality instead of this son relationship mentality with God. And I need to show you the difference. It's really important. I want you to jot these down. Here they are. Number one, the slave has a master. The slave has a master. And the master is always mad at you. 
right? The master's always demanding things from you. He's always telling you what to do. And when you approach the master, you kind of get low, you fall down, you go, oh, please, I hope he's nice to me this time. Please be nice to me, master. That's the mindset. I'm convinced that some Christians have this mindset of God. And then if we were to see God or get in his presence, I got to get low and I got to crawl and I got to, and, and it's this, I was doing some research and I found there was this church in Mexico that literally as a form of penance, just to, just to ensure that they kind of push this, this view of God, that they, they make their members, everyone who goes to this church in Mexico, they crawl on their knees all the way to church. So, so, so what, what would, in, 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 you would be able to see the blood trail from people's houses because they will go for miles. And, and if you do this time and time again, you got no more skin on your knees. So, so they would get on their knees and crawl all the way to church because God is just too, he's, he's big. Can I tell you, that's a wrong spirit that God, God does not want you operating in that spirit. The slave has a master, but the son has a father. And that relationship's different. I mean, you get into the Father's lap. The Father wants to protect you. The Father wants to love you. The Father is there for you. That's the spirit of the Father. Jesus came when he was, when he was on earth in his ministry. He had the spirit of, of just this Father inside of him. You know why I know that? Because kids were attracted to him. He was like a kid magnet. The Bible says that the disciples had to pull the kids off of him. You got to be... You, there's only there's a certain type of person that's a kid magnet. Not everybody's a kid magnet, right? There's a certain type of person that attracts kids, a certain type of personality that attracts kids. And I'm telling you, the Jesus that maybe that you have seen, maybe from Hollywood, it, that's not the Jesus. That's the kid magnet. You know, the malnourished, sucked in cheeks Jesus. The sad, somber Jesus with his robe just... Blessing people with his golf ball, you know, curveball throw. That's not Jesus. That is not, I'm telling you, in order to be a kid magnet, Jesus must have been like, hey, 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 woo, come on, kids, go. He must have been like candy in his robe, handing out candy and stuff. Why? Because that's the they said they were attracted to him because he had a, the spirit of a the father, the son. Has a father. It's important that you know the difference. Watch Romans chapter 8 here. The same concept, verse 15. The spirit you receive, notice again, it's a spirit. The, the sonship, the spirit of, of adoption, it's, some, it's a spirit of, of the son that you, you can receive. Do, it doesn't make you slaves. It doesn't make you operate like that so that you live in fear again. By the way, you can always tell if you're operating as a slave if you're afraid of God. You want to know if you're operating from a more slave mentality or the son or the daughter mentality? Well, are you afraid of God? Just, just think about that. Rather, the spirit you received brought, your, uh, brought about your adoption to, and here's that word again, your adoption to sonship. Now watch this. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And that might not mean a lot to you because that's Aramaic, that word Abba, but this is going to help you a lot to know that what this word means. This word in Aramaic is the most in, endearing word that one can use of the father. It's, it'd be translated today as daddy. Daddy. Like, like the spirit within us wants to cry, my daddy, father. My kids call me all different names. They, like most, for the most part, they all call me different. So one calls me dad, one calls me daddy, one calls me dada. For the most part. And I don't know why. I think, I, I think though it's because they want to have a personal, endearing relationship with me. So they've all chose different names to associate with me. But you can, listen to this, you can always tell the type of relationship you have with someone by the name or by what you call them. What do you, what do you call them? We cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself, it says, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You can always tell. So when you pray, how do you talk to God? In what terms? The Bible says we cry out, Daddy, Daddy, and I can tell even right now, me just even saying that makes some of you feel uncomfortable. Like, I can't call daddy. I was a daddy, you know? And, but, but listen, I, I, want that, I want your relationship, relationship with him to change. I want your relationship with your father to be on a more endearing term. Sometimes I hear people pray like, you know, King Jesus and Master Jesus. And he is, you know, he's all those things. But if you miss this, I'm telling you, you're going 
you're going you're gonna to miss a foundational truth by which you operate in the power of the Spirit of God. It's this adopted sonship by which gives us power. It gives us anointing. It gives us relationship. We cry, Abba, Father. There's something, there's some, there, there's different people that call me. If you don't know me, sometimes I, some people that don't know me very well, they'll call me Reverend Hannish. Oh, hey, Reverend. Hey, Reverend, you, I can always tell they don't know me. No one calls me Reverend, man. I'm not Reverend nothing. You know, the people around here, they'll call me Pastor Jason or even Jason. Or if they're real close, they'll call me PJ. They're real close, PJ. You know, like, you know and that, that's cool. I enjoy that because that's endearing. One time someone called me P. Jason. I'm like, no, don't do that. I don't like that one. It's just, <laughs> not that. Someone asked me, what do you want me to call you? Like, do I call you Pastor Jason? Like, I said, I don't care. Just call me. Like, I don't need a title. I don't need a title for my name. I, 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 just, I, just, I just want to be endeared to you. That's, I want to be close to you. So I don't care what you call me. Just like, I just want to be endeared to you. That's the heart of the, of the Father. The way you call someone determines the relationship. I love this. Look at this next one, the difference between the two, slave and son. And that is that the slave is an employee. The slave is an employee. Have you ever been to the re- a restaurant? And you can, you can kind of tell if, if the hostess or the waitress or the person seating you, you can, that you can tell if they are just an employee or if they, ha- if they truly have the best interest of the business in mind. You can always tell that when you go, I was at a restaurant not too long ago and there was like a million people waiting and there was like all these open tables and that hostess was just, she was not in a hurry. Fifty-four, and it's just there's no. Can I tell you something? Like if if it, if if that was her business, every table would be full, every table, okay? Because she was she's she's operating from this state of being an employee. Um, if she owned the business, every ta- it would it would have been different. All for, and some of us, you see yourself as an employee for God, or you see yourself as working for God, and it's really not in your. Heart, in other words, in other words, you don't see Christianity as the family business. You don't, you don't see this as you don't see yourself as a son or a daughter of the house. You, you go to church, you serve on that team, you are part of something, but you don't see yourself as this is the family business. You see yourself from an employee mindset. It's just something you do, like a side gig. See, the slave is an employee, but the son is an heir. A son is an heir. It's your business. It's your family. It's like this church, look, these, these aren't the church's chairs. They're your chairs. This isn't the church's drum set. They're your drum set. I'm convinced that if, that if you can see it differently, then you will treat it differently. See, it's not God's mission to reach the world. It's our mission to reach the world. If you can see it differently, this is the family business that you were brought into as a co-heir in Christ. So when I walk into my car, I see a piece of paper. That's my paper. I'm going to pick that up. You, you, you go into the restroom, and there's, and there's, and there's, there's paper because someone, someone was washing their hands. They, they missed the trash can. That's my paper because it's my house. Some, a visitor comes and, and, and they look like they're a little bit, you know, a little bit confused and they don't know where to go. Well, this is my house. So I'm going to go to that visitor. I'm going to say, how can I help you? Can, can I help you find something? That's a different mentality of being a son and a daughter of the house and just being an employee of the house. You treat it differently. You treat it entirely differently. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, and this is this is powerful right here, co-heirs with Christ. So in God's mind, you become part of everything he has just as Jesus would have it. Can I say something to you? That means everything Jesus has, he wants you to have. That's, that's what that means. Everything that the Father has given the Son, he has given you and made available to you because you are now a co-heir with Christ. You see, God wants you healed. The Father wants you healed so you can heal others. The Father wants you free so you can free others in bondage. 
The father wants you blessed, not so that you can hoard your blessing, but because he knows you're in the family business and you're going to give that blessing away to other kids that need to know their father. Okay, this is, this is the adoption we need to see, the spirit of the sonship that we need to see that it just changes everything. It changes everything. So I started praying personally, my prayers and the prayers of this church, I started praying differently because I, I used to pray little prayers like, you know, God provide for us type stuff, you know, help us to, to, to make it. <laughs> and, and I started praying, God, give us more than enough. God, give us more than enough. Not because not because not because I'm greedy or we're greedy. God, give us more than enough so we can change the world. Give us more than enough because because we'll be faithful with it. We're going to bless others with it. So God, give us more than enough. Okay. Um, this third one needs a little pre-scripture. I need to give you a scripture to clarify the point before I give you the point. I don't do that very often, but I need to, I need to give you a scripture before I give you the point to clarify this 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 point here because last week we talked about grace and there are some people that are just like oh my goodness like they they're for some something inside of them they can't handle this grace gospel i've had conversations with people about this topic over years and and one time a guy actually told me straight up like i just disagree with you pastor i just I, i disagree and i was like what do you disagree with and he's well i just think that people need to change People just can't come up in here and receive in everything and not change. They got to change, Pastor. They just, they just man, they just got to, they got to change. And, and it just, so for some reason, it irritates um, some people, this grace, this grace um, gospel. But what I explained to them is grace, like this has to be free. It has to be free because we, in order for us to get everything from God, it has to be given to us free through grace because we cannot attain it ourselves. It has to be free it has it has to be free this is in in and it doesn't so people think like now like oh well this is the misunderstanding i think well because of grace then i guess i could do whatever i want that's the misunderstanding which is and i think that's where people get hung up well can i just do whatever i want just live how i want talk how i want do whatever i want and and no 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 that's not the that's not what we're saying here um it doesn't you you just you just you can't, do it, you can't do it first is what it's talking about. Okay, so, so you can't get it first. The order's important. You can't try to do things first. You need to receive grace first because grace is the thing that anoints and empowers you to do everything that God has called you to do. Does that make sense, you guys? And people still demand for people to just do things first to get to God, and you can't. It can't. So let me help you understand the balance of this. Um, let me give you this scripture here. So you, so you receive the grace of God, and when you do, if there's a verse that ever describes anything that, like, what I want for you as your pastor, what I want for you, Philippians chapter 2, this is what I want for you. It says, work hard. Well, wait a second, Jason. You just told me it was free. Yeah, okay. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. So you don't work hard to get saved because you can't. You can't. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Now watch this. This is my dream verse for you right here. For God is working in you. God is working in you. He can only work in you, by the way, if you receive this grace gift. Like that, that's the work of inside of you. But now he's working in you. Watch what happens. Giving you the desire. And, and this is what I want for you. I don't want you just doing this thing called Christianity, doing this thing called church, or following God because you have to. What I really want is for your desires to change because you want to. Like where you'd experience God in such a way, you'd experience the grace of God in such a way that it just it changes your desire. That's why you'll never hear here at Discover, you'll never hear me kind of come up here and demand you guys to do something. I won't tell you, you need to, you have to, and if you don't, that's never going to happen. That's not the language we use here. That's not how we we roll, because God does it. Your desires will change, and check it out, and the power to do it. He'll He'll give you the desire and the power to complete it. Wouldn't it be better for you to do what you want to do, not because you should do it, but because there was a desire and a power to do it? That's the difference of grace. That's the difference of this adoption into sonship, that we are sons and daughters of God. That's the difference, that God changes 
the desire and gives the power to complete his will and his purpose. That's the difference. So that's my setup verse for the last distinction. Okay, here it is. Here's the last distinction. That the slave is driven by duty. You have to do it. We talked about this last week. So, so I got to go to church. Oh, rah, rah, got to go to church. Oh, okay. Okay, got to go. Rah, 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 rah. It's Mother's Day. I guess I'll go. Rah, rah, rah. Some of you heard that this morning. I guess I got to read my Bible. Okay, I guess I got to pray. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about Serve Day coming up real soon. And Serve Day, okay, so for th- some of you that are in the right spirit, you're going to go, when, when we start talking about Serve Day again, it's going to be like, Serve Day again? Man, I, has it been a year since we went out and blessed the community? That is so awesome. It was so fun. I can't wait for Serve Day. And then some of you in the wrong spirit are going to go, Oh my God, blah, 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 Serve Day? That's my Saturday. And you're just, and it's going to be the wrong. You're going it, to, it's the wrong spirit that you, the slave is driven by, by duty. Here's the difference. The son is driven by devotion. The son is driven by devotion. It's just, man, I love you so much, God. It's my joy to do it. Like I want to do it. The desire and the power. I want to, God. It's my joy. Probably the best verse in the Bible that describes this distinction between these two. Let me show it to you. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. A lot of you know this story. It says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, let me just pause right there and say they both love Jesus. They both, don't don't miss that, okay? They both love Jesus and they both wanted Jesus desperately to offer something to Jesus. They wanted to give their God, their Lord, Jesus, something, but they were doing it in different spirits. So she came, Martha comes to Jesus and asks him, Lord, don't you, don't, don't you care that my life my life when you do the work on my life? Tell her how That's the spirit. That's the, right? That's the spirit. She actually went to Jesus that way. Jesus, tell her, Jesus, tell her. And he says, Martha, you're wrong. You got, the wrong. you got the wrong spirit. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're so worried and upset about many things. But there's just few things that are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has, and here's the key word, I love it. Mary has chosen. You know, you can choose this relationship. You don't have to feel this. You can actually choose the relationship you have with God. It's a choice. I'm going to be in a relationship with God and check it out. It's better. It's way better to operate in this relationship with God. Devotion instead of duty. Okay, so how do we do it then? Let me continue back in Galatians, picking up there in verse 8 now. Paul says, Formerly when you did not, and here's the answer, when you did not know God. So he's saying when you were in the other way, when you were in the whole slave version when you when you were like oh i need to work i need to please god i need to uh yeah i'm, I'm like an employee of god version here's the problem he says you, you didn't have something you didn't know god you didn't know him like you need to know him that's when you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods but now that you know god or rather are known by god how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles that dead religion. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? And that's where he corrects the Galatian church. That's where, guys, he corrects us from from operating from the wrong spirit with God. What do I have to do then? What What do I have to do to know him? So can I help you know him? Can I help you know God today? Can I help you know God as father? That's what I want to do. I want to help you know your God as Father. And if you ever want to know God this way, there's, there's, several, there's several steps really that you can take that if you took these steps, if you took these steps, it'll help you know God as your Father and relate to Him, not as an employee or as a slave, but as a son, as a daughter. Here, let me give them to you. Write these down. It starts with how you see God now. It starts with your vision, your sight. Write it down this way. We need to see God as Father. We need to see Him as Father. It starts with your eyes. How do you even see him? you got to see God as Father. So when you come to God, what does he look like? 
What is your view of God? On what terms do you relate to him? Your view of God will determine your relationship with God. What you think he's like will determine how you relate to him. And that's why we need to start with the eyes. So what does he look like? Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 to explain. Which of you, of his sons, Jesus says, ask for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or ask for fish, we'll give him a snake. A father wouldn't do that. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus was revolutionizing people's mindsets here that, man, God's not a lightning bolt that's ready to strike me dead. He's not like a pillar of fire and of smoke. No, he's a father. He's a father who wants to give you good things. And there's a problem with this because here's the problem. Because most of us grew up with bad earthly ones. We grew up with some bad earthly fathers. And I'm personally convinced that it infects and it pollutes the way you relate to your heavenly father. You see, the devil, and the devil knows this. He's very wise and he's crafty. The devil knows that the, the reason why the devil wanted to get between your relationship with your father, the reason why he wanted to separate it, divide it, and create dysfunction in that, because he knew if he could succeed in that, that he could affect and infect the way you relate to your heavenly father. Okay? Look, the devil doesn't care if you go to church. Remember in part one, he was in the Garden of Eden. The devil doesn't care if you're godly. He just doesn't want you to be godly the right way in relationship with your father. He wants you to be godly. Sure, go ahead and be godly by doing all you can. Go to church all you can, serve all you can, give all you can. The devil will let you to do all that stuff as long as you just don't do it from the position of an adopted son or an adopted daughter because that's where the power comes from. That's where the desires and the power comes from. Man, this is good. If you can get this, you guys, if you can operate like this, that, that he is your father and see him as your father. Here's the second one. Once you see him as father, you see him correctly, you got to approach him now. So how do we approach him? Well, you approach God through relationship, not through rules. This is going to help you now. Approach God through relationship, not through rules. So most homes, you have, most homes have rules, right? There's like house rules. Every home kind of has like house rules. I hope there's some house rules and the kids aren't running amok and stuff. Some of our, some of our rules are like bedtime. Our kids have a bedtime. They go to bed at eight o'clock. They're in the bed. Electronics are off. They can't have so much of the electronics a day. They can't have any soda only once a day. And it's at one of the meals a day and they get to choose that meal. And most of the time it's not even caffeinated. And you, can't, and you can't have sweets after a certain time. So there's, there's just some rules, but, but every, every now and then, um, you, a, a child can gain favor with the father outside of the rules. <laughs> it's true, right? It's true. Like my, my daughter, Grace, she's part of the junior high group here, and there was just recently, I think it was just this last study. If you're not bringing your kids who are in junior high and high school, man, you're missing out. My daughter, she received some revelation on Wednesday from her, from her leaders here, and she got into the car, and she was just like, Dad, I just, wow. God spoke to me. He showed me. And she's like, I want to tell you, but I don't want to cry. I said, no, you can tell me, sweetheart. We can, you can tell me. I want to know. I'm, and so she starts to tell me and crying about what God showed her, how she ha- is using like an escapism, like as to instead of escaping to God and receiving from God, she's using something else. She said, yeah. and she's just crying. I was in that car, and I, it's like almost 9 o'clock, and I said, you're getting ice cream, baby. Come on, Sonic. <laughs> Come on, baby. Talk to daddy some more. Let's, let's take our time. And... and <laughs> Every now and then, the father loves that. My son, Caleb, he, he came recently, uh, like several weeks ago, he came and just plopped himself down by me while I was um, doing sermon prep, studying. And, and I'm like, you know, he wants something, right? He, come on, I wasn't born yesterday. The kids just don't come and plop down by daddy unless they want something. Come on now. So I'm like, I'm just finishing my thought. I'm like, oh, hold on. And I'm just finishing the thought. So I finish my thought. And I'm like, okay, what do you, what do you want? Nothing. Come on now. You want something? No, no, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want, boy? What's up? I'm just bored, Dad. I just, I'm just bored. I just want to come hang out with you. Do you mind if I just come and hang out with you for a little bit? 
I put that thing, come on, boy, let's go play some ball or something. What, can I give anything? To, what do you want? Anything at all? I'm going to give it to you right now because he, he approached me as his father. In a relationship with me, not as, not, he, it tugs, I'm telling you, it tugs the, the, the father's heart when you approach him through relationship, not rules. This is so critical here. So you don't, how do you approach your prayer life? How do you approach your word and devotion life? How do you approach God when you're scheduled to serve? How do you approach God with your money? How do you, do you do it on rules or are you approaching God based on relationship? This is so important, you guys. How do you approach God. So Jesus says in John chapter 5, 39, just a foundational verse in this entire series, you diligently study, Jesus says, the scriptures because you think that if you study those scriptures, you're going to get eternal life, but you're missing the whole point. He says, the scriptures are there to testify about me, you, and you, yet you refuse to come to me. That doesn't have life in it. I am the resurrection and the life. You see, you weren't just supposed to read your Bible for an hour to have a devotion time. You were supposed to read your Bible to find me. You weren't supposed to just you know, g- g- pray more so that you could pray more. You were to pray more to be with me. You weren't just supposed to go and serve. You were supposed to go and serve with me. You were supposed to find me in that. It was the relationship, not the rules. You were supposed to meet with me. Man, I want you to receive this today, you guys. This can help define everything else. If you get this right, the sonship, if you get this spirit of the son that lives inside of you and you can operate as daughter, you operate as son, it'll change everything about your walk with Christ. It's this will. So you got to see him as father. Secondly, you have to approach him in relationship, not based on rules. And then and thirdly here, give God your whole heart. Give God your whole heart. So when you do it, go all in with God. Go, go all in. You got to go all in. Listen, I'm telling you, this, this, this falling in love with God thing, this Christian thing, this walk with Jesus thing, it does not work unless you go all in. It doesn't. It'll frustrate you. If you go 90% in and you leave 10% out, I'm telling you, you're, you're going to be like, well, this ain't very fun. Yeah, I, I know because you didn't go all in. It doesn't work. This is what the scripture is saying. Jeremiah 29 explains this. God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, the antithesis of this verse is also true. If, so if you seek me with part of your heart, you'll never find me. You're going to be one of those who burn out and fade away. No, no, you, you, got, you got to go all in. You got, to go, you got to give them all of you, your entire heart. And he says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I can be found, God says. I'm not hiding from you. I am here. You just need to give me your whole heart. You can have this experience if you go all in, in this relationship with God. I think this is pretty cool that this message falls on Mother Day, Mother's Day. Because most of us, um, our mom's relationship is one that it's endearing, it's in our heart. M- most people, and, and some do, some have that type of relationship with their father, but most don't, just because of the plan of the enemy in our culture. It's very sad, but you'll be able to relate to this. Most, most of us have, we have this, like God, our mom is in our heart, right? It's so funny to me, like the, the dad will play, you know, teach the kid how to play football and catch and run like that, but then when he makes it big time, he's like, I love you, mama. Why? Why? Because mom's in his heart. Mama's in his heart. Why, why, why can you be messing around with the guys and stuff like that? But then when you talk about my mama, you know, you don't talk about my mama. Who are you talking about? You don't know my mama. So leave my mom out of this, okay? You can just, uh, why? Because mom's in our heart. This is the difference, you guys. This is the, the difference of having someone in your heart. It goes from going from the Bible tells me I need to do so so I've been adopted to sonship, and he's changed me, my desires, and given me power. The, by, it goes from I have to, to I want to, to this, I got him in my heart. My father's in my heart. And if I could summarize this entire message up in one sentence, let me give it to you, and then we're going to pray this last fill-in for you, is that relationship changes everything. 
Hey, you may want to write it down personal for you. Sonship changes everything. Being a daughter changes everything. It'll change everything. You know, that's why I want it so, so badly for you. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this auditorium here and go to God with that.